the next talk is about the drone attack. It's secure, they said. It will be fun, he said, and smashed it with a compute hammer. Sebastian Schinzel has been interested in IT security since a long time. He's a PhD at the FH Münster, and you may recall his talks back at 31, 28, or even 29 C3. Today, he will talk about the drone attack and how to attack TLS by making use of a server that supports SSL v2. Please welcome, with an anniversary edition applause, Sebastian Schenzel. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be back. And I'm very glad that no one is leaving right now because uh, we're presenting a new vulnerability in SSL version 2, right? It is kind of old. Uh, uh, the attack has a name, it has a web page, and it has even a logo. And uh, having said that, I'm really glad that no one's leaving the, uh, the, the room right now as well. Um, the talk will be on breaking TLS. And so pretty much everyone here in this room uh, uses TLS probably at this very, at this very moment while uh, your mobile phone is checking whatever is going on on Twitter, Facebook, so over HTTPS, or you're checking your emails and stuff like that, right? So, um, so TLS is, uh, is, is really important. Um, uh, the drone attack has 15 authors, and they obviously couldn't, couldn't all come here. The six of us here is like the most people that got on, uh, on, uh, uh, like on, um, uh, on, a, on a single picture. And if you look closely, uh, we are very happy to have received uh, the first uh, Pony Award for the best uh, cryptographic attack in 2016. So we're, we're really happy about this. But um, so when we talk about SSL version 2, what is, what is really SSL version 2? So SSL version 2 was, um, was created in 1995 and it was immediately broken in 1995, right? So in the same year, just a few months later. So how did the internet look like during these ages? Pretty, pretty, pretty much like this, right? This is the internet of, uh, of the 1990s with uh, some cryptographic primitives like DES and RC4 and RC2 and so on and so on. Most of them are broken. And there's also some really interesting things like here export 40 bits, something like this, right? That's uh, um, uh, like a cipher primitive that was created because of like politics, right? Uh, cryptographic regulations in the 90s said that you're only supposed to export uh, crypto crypt cryptography uh, with a certain strength, with a certain maximum strength out of the US, and this is what we see here, right? So in 1995, SSL version 2 immediately died, and the reason for that is that, um, like, the creators of SSL version 2, it was published by Netscape, um, uh, they, uh, they didn't authenticate the handshake. So uh, an active man in the middle could uh, just intercept the handshake and uh, force you and the server, you as a client and the server, to negotiate a very weak uh, encryption. And there was no fix for that. So right, this is nothing that you could fix off because it, it was a protocol issue. And so therefore, uh, in 1996, one year later, they came up with SSL version 3, which is still the basis uh, on the protocol level for the TLS that we see, that we see uh, today and that we use every day. Right. So now you could say, okay, SSL version 2 was uh, published in 1995 and it was broken in 1995. No one's, no one's ever going to use this right now. Okay, I've got some data for you. So this is an internet-wide uh, scan uh, of the whole IPv4 internet in February 2016. And what you see here is not the amount of hosts, that's the percentage of all the uh, uh, TLS and SSL supporting um, uh, systems in, on the internet. And there you see, for example, that 28% of all uh, servers listening on port 25, which is SMTP, use SSL version 2, which is really, really strange, right? I'll, I'll, I'll come later to this point, what, what was the reason for that? 
And even for, um, um, for HTTPS port 443, we still see 17% of all the hosts out there uh, directly support SSL version 2, which is really, really strange, right? So and you could even say, right, these old dinosaurs all are coming back somehow um, uh, to haunt us, uh, 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 us users on the internet, right? Okay. So to give you an overview, what is Drown all about? So Drown is a fairly sophisticated exploit chain, and I will, I will, it will take me some time to, to explain all the puzzle pieces. So therefore, this is just a short overview um, of the, like the requirements that an attacker needs to do in order to, in order to, to run an, uh, a Drown exploit. So first of all, we can break one in 1,000 TLS connections. So not every, not every TLS connection, but only one in 1,000. Um, that basically means, uh, so to, in order to break one of your TLS connections, the attacker has, on average, has to collect 1,000 TLS connections from you. Um, these can be connections that were recorded long before Drown was known. Right? So we're not talking about an active attack, it's a passive attack, and so therefore just clicking record in your Wireshark is already sufficient. And if you did this like uh, on a Congress three or four years ago, you can break the TLS connections that you recorded back then, maybe under certain conditions right now. Okay, it doesn't come for free, so you need to perform two to the 50 encryptions, which is, which is a lot. We can do this, but we need rather beefy hardware in order, in order to do this. And there's one more requirement. We need to do around 40,000 connections to that, uh, to that server that supports SSL version 2, right? So we need one server that supports SSL version 2. And one very important thing is um, clients don't support SSL version 2 for, for a very long time. So the last browser that supported SSL version 2 was Internet Explorer 6 on XP. Right? And even Internet Explorer 6 would always prefer SSL version 3. Right? So if there's a way to, to, to negotiate SSL version 3, it, was, it, it would also always use that. So, um, so we're, we're really breaking TLS connections. So the connections that your very uh, recent T, uh, TLS client does right now, under the condition that the same server is supporting SSL version 2, which is really strange, right? So we break TLS, using SSL. Okay. So uh, we did an exploit, and also we put a lot of effort into optimizing the attack, and the best thing that we could do was breaking a single TLS connection on Amazon EC2 uh, for 440 US dollars. So which is pretty, right? So if everyone here gives like maybe 50 cents or so, that would be already sufficient to break a single TLS connection. So and I, I don't need to break a lot of TLS connection. Uh, I just need to break a single uh, TLS connection that your um, uh, a POP3 client does every minute or so to, to get your email, because there your, your password is, is, uh, is in there. And if we get your password, right, we can break all the, all the residual. All right, so, so breaking just a, a single one is uh, sufficient in most cases. Okay, I said there's uh, a lot of puzzle pieces that we, that we need to do, and I try to cluster them to, to, to make them more di digestible. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about is a, is a special attack that I've already talked about two years ago. I will just go briefly into it. If you're interested more into the details of Bleichenbacher's attack, just look, watch, watch more for my talk in uh, 31C3. I will show you a new protocol flaw in SSL version 2, and I, I need to explain what is it with 40-bit uh, export ciphers. So when we combine these three puzzle pieces, we have a practical attack ag against SSL version 2, which is not relevant at all, because no one is speaking SSL version 2 on the internet anymore. Um, uh, we just have servers that support it generally, but usually there's, we couldn't find any, any client that, that still negotiates SSL version 2. Okay. A second thing that we have to look at is uh, shared keys among the different SSL and TLS versions. So when you set up an, an SSL server uh, and it supports SSL version 2, version 3, and TLS 1.0 up to uh, 1.2, it will always use the same RSA key pair, right? And when we take this into account, 
all of a sudden, Drown becomes a practical attack against many TLS servers. Right? It's practical in an academic sense. It still means it's an expensive attack, but we can do it. Right? We can afford it. We all here can afford it. And, and then we have two implementation errors. So all of the above uh, practically means that we can attack every SSL version 2 implementation that is out there. Now, uh, here we are looking into two implementation errors in OpenSSL, and if we take, if we combine these with the already existing drone attack, we all of a sudden get a trivial attack, really trivial, that means it, it takes minutes on this laptop against a lot of TLS servers, right? Okay, so let's start with uh, Bleichenbacher's 1998 attack, and uh, before I start with that, I just want to quickly repeat uh, the RSA-based key exchange uh, for TLS. So um, there's various ways of negotiating uh, like a key, and when I say a key, it always means a symmetric key, right? So asymmetric encryption, for example, with RSA is pretty expensive, so therefore we just do the key exchange, like as we, we exchange a, a symmetric key over RSA, which is not that, not that much data. And then the actual content that will be transferred over the SSL or TLS connection, um, this will use AES or triple DES or DES or RC4 or something like this. And what we are looking at is right now only the part where we negotiate this key for the symmetric encryption. So we have a TLS client, we have a TLS server. The TLS client always starts with a client hello, and it contains a client random number. This will be like, this changes with every request. So the client changes this number with every request, and it will be sent in clear text, so the attacker knows this. Uh, the second message, the response of the TLS server will be the server hello. It will uh, generate a random number as well. It's a server random, and this will also change with every, with every new connection, and it's also sent in clear text. So the attacker knows client random and server random. And then it also sends this certificate that you buy for Komodo or uh, uh, at Komodo or even at Let's Encrypt or so you get it for free. And in this very certificate, there's an RSA public key, right? And this RSA public key will be uh, also sent with a uh, certificate, and with the next message, the client key exchange, uh, the TLS client generates a thing that is called a pre-master secret. Um, and this is the only part that is really secret in this whole, in this whole exchange. It will not send this pre-master secret in clear, but it will encrypt it with RSA and the key from the certificate that it just received from the server and send this over. And the next step, and this is a very important step, the TLS server decrypts the pre-master secret that it just received, and from this pre-master secret, both the client and the server can generate the same symmetric key, okay? So that means uh, the, uh, the, the, the attacker knows the client random, it knows the server random, and it gets an encrypted version of the pre-master secret. And uh, if the attacker can, can, can decrypt this pre-master secret, he knows the master secret, this symmetric key that is used for RC4, IAS, and stuff like that. Right? So this is the holy grail that we want to break right now, and Bleichenbacher's attack ex ex achieves exactly this. Right? So that's important. Uh, what I need to mention here is this decryption can fail. So when the attacker sends, uh, let's say, an arbitrary ciphertext, some, some junk data or so, uh, the server first has to decrypt uh, this ciphertext in order to find out whether this is a, uh, a valid pre-master secret or not. Okay. So in order to conduct the Bleichenbacher's attack, we need an oracle. So like, that's a cryptographic term um, uh, for nothing else than a service that accepts an arbitrary ciphertext, and it will decrypt this uh, ciphertext, so it needs to have the RSA private key, and it re responds with one or zero, so true or false, depending on the successful decryption. Right? So if the decryption was successful and the pre-master secret looks somehow valid, right? looks somehow, um, uh, uh, then it will say, okay, it's true, or otherwise it's false. So we only get one bit of information from, from this oracle. So we have a client here and a server. We have an attacker that uh, eavesdrops on this connection, and then it changes 
certain parameters of this connection and sends it over to the Oracle. The Oracle decrypts it, uh, uh, parses it, and then says, okay, decryption was successful or, or not. That's the only information that the attacker gets, gets from the Oracle. So every time the Oracle answers with a one or with true, the attacker learns a tiny fraction of the RSA uh, ciphertext. So there's a mathematical formula where you could put everything in, and if the attacker only does this, uh, let's say, a few thousand times or so, he can learn the full ciphertext. He doesn't get the RSA private key. We only get, like, uh, we only can decrypt this, this, this single RSA ciphertext. Okay. So uh, in the original paper of Deichenbacher from 1998, uh, he was exploiting the fact that um, common TLS implementations would would like they, they had like an explicit error message for this type of decryption failure, which is really bad. And um, so they didn't actually fix uh, the the SSL or the TLS standard. Uh, they just said, okay, here's an implementation fix so that the Bleichenbacher attack won't work anymore. And it works like this. So uh, we pretend that the decrypted pre-master secret that we have received was correct, and we proceed with a random pre-master secret. So in case that uh, the, the, uh, the ciphertext that we have just received was invalid, we just generate a random pre-master secret and continue with, with, with the flow, and this will obviously uh, lead, to, lead to some later error because the symmetric key that comes out here is different for the client and the server. So they simply speak with a different key and can't decrypt each other, and then it comes to an error. Right? So this looks like this. So the server will decrypt the pre-master secret, he will always generate a random pre-master secret, and then depending of whether the uh, decryption uh, succeeded or not, uh, when it succeeded, it will proceed with a decrypted pre uh, PMS. In, in the case where the decryption failed, it will proceed with a random pre-master secret that it just generated. And so, uh, this makes all the implementations that we looked at, like it's, it's indistinguishable whether the decryption uh, succeeded or whether it failed. So it's an implementation fix that is written in the, in the RFC. Okay. Now we exploited this very countermeasure for Bleichenbacher attack, for Bleichenbacher's attack in order to conduct a new Bleichenbacher's attack, right? And it works like this. Okay. Um, um, <clears throat> So let's look at the SSL version 2 protocol. It changes, uh, it's, it's, it's slightly different from SSL version 3, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter here. So we also have a client hello, we also have a server hello. We also have this kind of client key exchange, it has just a different name, where we send this symmetric key that was generated by the client, and um, then, both would, uh, uh, then both would generate those symmetric keys. And what is interesting here is the, the first one that responds with an encrypted message will be the server. And this has very, one uh, very important implication. That means uh, the, the client gets one ciphertext, so the server verify is an encrypted message, with a key, uh, so with that master key that both client and server should know by, by now. Um, and it, uh, the, the client gets this message without proving that it has the same symmetric key. In, in SSL version 3 and in TLS, this is different. So uh, this, uh, uh, this message here will only be sent uh, after the client proved with a, with a finished message that he possesses the same symmetric key. So the attacker gets one ciphertext that is encrypted with an unknown key because we don't know the, we don't know the key yet. The question, and please accept it, that this is now uh, an important uh, an important question that we need to raise, and I'll explain it in the in the la in the next two f uh, slides. Can we learn this key? So we get a ciphertext, and the the question is, can we learn the key that was used to encrypt that message? Now, when we look at the specifications of SSL version two, we learn that there are so-called export ciphers that only have 40 bits of strength. So this is how a cipher suite looks like, and it, and it keeps on looking like this. It always has the same format. It tells us there's an, uh, so the symmetric key 
uh, algorithm that we use is RC2. It uses 128-bit keys. It uses a CBC as a, uh, as a mode of encryption. And it uses export 40 with MD5 as an, hash, as an hash algorithm. So that means we have a 128-bit key, but only 40-bit of those are encrypted. I told you the client generates the symmetric key and send, encrypts it with the public key of the server and sends it over. And here it doesn't uh, fully encrypt the 128-bit, but only the 40 bits. Only 40 bits will be encrypted and 88 bits are sent in clear. So everyone can read it. And in the 90s, the, the Clinton administration did this regulation. They said, okay, so 40 bit is enough to protect like people with, with online banking stuff and, and so on and so on. Um, but the, obviously the US government wanted to look into the, into the SSL connections of whatever country this, uh, this cryptographic code will be exported. When you look at the implementation, uh, the master key will be built uh, in a way that uh, the clear bits, the 88 clear bits, will be concatenated to the decrypted 40-bit secret keys, right? And obviously for non-export ciphers, so you get the same cipher suite without the export 40 here. For non-export ciphers, the length of MK clear, so the, the bits that are sent in clear, is zero. Okay, fair enough, right? Okay, this is maybe not the best idea to do something like this from, from a politician's viewpoint, but still, okay, it makes sense. Okay, at least in the 90s. Okay, so let's look at this server verify, this single uh, message that we get uh, uh, and where we want to know the, the key. When we look at the specifications, we learn that the server verify is, is nothing else uh, than the client random that it sent us in the client hello. So we know the clear text because it was sent in a clear and that was encrypted with a master key. So we know the plain text and we know the cipher text. And we also know when we negotiate this with an, a 40-bit uh, export ciphers, which, which we can do, then only 40 of those bits of this master, uh, master key are secret, which means we, we, we can do a brute force search for the key. We know the plain text, we know the cipher text, then we can uh, look for the key because there's only two to the 40 uh, possibilities uh, of, of the key size, which takes on, on beefy hardware a few seconds or a few minutes, right? But you can even do it on this laptop and maybe finish in a day or so, okay? So this is nothing, nothing really, nothing really uh, critical. Okay. So let me show you why this is important uh, and why this forms a, a new Bleichenbacher oracle. So let's assume we, uh, we create a new ciphertext, a new encrypted pre-master secret using export 40 bits, and uh, send it to the server, and we do, that, we do it twice with the same ciphertext. Then we get two server verify messages, and we break the key that was used to create the server verify messages. In case that the pre-master secret was correct, we follow this path. There we proceed with a decrypted PMS. And as we didn't change the ciphertext, the pre-master secret is the same. So therefore the master secret is the same. So therefore, right, we get, we get the same master key. In case the pre-master secret is invalid, we follow this path here, which means that the master keys for both server verifies will be different because it will be generated and a new pre-master secret is generated for each and every request that comes in. And this we could distinguish, right? So this forms a new Bleichenbacher oracle with the only condition, so we don't get any, um, we don't get any error messages from, from the server, right? Everything is correctly implemented as in the RFC, but if, if we send uh, two ciphertext, um, the problem here is, uh, uh, so when the server verify, the key to, to, uh, to generate the server verify was the same for both messages, then we know uh, it was invalid, otherwise it was, it was valid. Okay. So when we had this, and it was a much larger group that came up with this, uh, with this attack, uh, so we had a practical attack as, uh, against SSL version 2. And now you need to imagine like a bunch of academics in their ivory tower, you know, like high-fiving. So, yeah, we, do, we did a new attack, a uh, new cryptographic attack, but it has zero relevance, 
right? So, so we were missing each other, something like this, right? Okay. Um, so we needed to look further. That's not sufficient, okay? It's a cool, it's a cool academic attack, but it's not relevant at all for, for the internet. So let's look at um, how people use SSL and TLS, how they configure it. Um, when you uh, set up a new server using Apache or Nginx or IIS or, or whatever, uh, at least to my knowledge, there's no way of saying if a client comes in and he connects using TLS 1.2, then he gets key A, and if, when he connects with SSL uh, version 3, he gets a different key. That doesn't seem to be possible. So that means when you set up a system with a key pair, they always use the same key material. It's always the same RSA uh, public key and private key pair that will be served independently with a protocol version it is. Okay? So that's an important insight. Um, what is also very interesting is... Um, it, it, a valid question would be, will people use the same TLS certificates for different protocols? So are there people out there that buy a certificate or get a certificate from, uh, from Let's Encrypt or so, and use it for HTTPS, for SMTP, for IMAP, for POP3, and all the different uh, other, uh, other ports? And, uh, it, um, and it turns out they do, okay? Um, which is a problem because everyone is looking at the secure configuration of HTTPS. So everyone is looking at HTTPS and no one really is looking at the security of the TLS configurations of IMAP, POP3, uh, SMTP, and, and so on and so on. So, um, which leads to the fact, I said, Bleichenbacher's attack works against RSA ciphertext. It's nothing written that this is specific to a, a specific TLS version, it's a generic RSA uh, 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 decryption oracle, right? So which, which means if we have 10 systems and these 10 systems all share the same certificate and only one of those 10 systems is vulnerable to drown, then the connections to all 10 systems can be broken because it's a generic, it's a generic, a generic RSA uh, decryption oracle. So it works like this. This is pretty clear, right? So when we have a server uh, and it accepts TLS connections and SSL version 2 connections, then an attacker can eavesdrop on this TLS connection, record it, and use this server as a Bleichenbacher oracle over SSL version 2 in order to break it. So there, uh, we, uh, so if a system supports SSL version 2, all the TLS connections that go there can be broken as well. That's pretty clear. What is new here is, let's, have, let's say we have two versions, we have two servers, and both use uh, the same RSA key material, maybe the same certificate or even the same certificate, actually, or, or a different certificate. So um, what we saw with, um, with Heartbleed uh, was uh, the Heartbleed attack would compromise the keys. So using a Heartbleed attack, an attacker could uh, learn the private key of that TLS server. So you had to apply for a new, uh, a new certificate. You had to buy a new certificate. What many people did is they used the same RSA key pair that was compromised in, the, in a previous certificate and bought a new certificate with the same keys that was compromised before, right? Which is not a very good idea. Okay, so it could be, it could even be that both use a different certificate but have the same RSA key pair, right? We saw this on the internet as well. So in this case, uh, we, let's assume this server here doesn't support SSL version 2, so it's not directly vulnerable to drown. The attacker can still eavesdrop on the TLS connections that it sees here and breaks it afterwards by making connect SSL version 2 connections to this server, which uses the same key material and supports SSL version 2. Right. So, um, and when we when we scan the internet, uh, to what, what how this affects the amount of hosts that are vulnerable to drown, this was pretty pretty dramatic. But uh, before before we look into this, let me just um, not go through all the numbers that you see here. I just put on all the numbers that you see that it's really a substantial amount of of RSA key pair. Uh, 
sharing on the internet. So you have to read this table like this. Uh, for all the SMTP servers, we collected the TLS certificates and then looked where did we see this public key in maybe a different certificate or the same certificate on some other port. And there we saw, for example, from all the TLS certificates that we encountered on SMTP, 30% we found on IMAP. Uh, no, that's POP3. 29% uh, we found on, um, uh, uh, on IMAP and so on and so on. And so what is really interesting here is people seem to share uh, a substantial amount of keys across protocols, which is pretty substantial. This is very interesting here. So when you look, for example, for HTTPS, so a lot of servers on HTTPS were, uh, were vulnerable. Um, but as I said, HTTPS, many people look at the configuration of HTTPS. No one seems to care about the TLS configuration of SMTP. It's even like this, that people say for SMTP, if you can't negotiate a TLS connection, um, if you can't negotiate a TLS connection, it will fall back to plain text. So for SMTP, bad encryption, bad cryptography is better than plain text, right? But what we have here right now is when people have a bad SMTP TLS connection and use the same key material for HTTPS, we can break your HTTPS connections by exploiting the weaknesses in your SMTP configuration, which is pretty, pretty substantial. So and when we look at the numbers, this, uh, in most cases, it doubles. So we had, uh, let's say for uh, port 25, 28% of all the SMTP servers that support encryption on the internet were vulnerable to drown. Now, when we uh, extend this attack, and say, okay, um, we have this system here and we want to attack it. The system itself is not vulnerable to drown, but the public key is used on some other system on the internet on a different port. Um, uh, uh, we can do the attack there. And that obvious, that th this here means that 50% of all SMTP servers, encryption wise, can, can be broken. For uh, port 43, for example, it's one third of uh, all the internet that support encryption, we could break TLS connections to these systems by exploiting some other system that happens to use the same RSA key pair and supports SSL version 2. So it's a really substantial, uh, uh, substantial effect that we encountered here. Okay. So I said that Drown itself is not a cheap attack. So it's actually quite complex. And we uh, thought about how can we how can, how can we like, make efficient attacks for, uh, for Drown? We need to do this, like, uh, so we, we need to, to perform two to the 40 exhaustive searches, so encryptions or decryptions, and we need to do this for around 1,000 Oracle queries. Right? So that's, uh, that's a lot, two to the 50. And so we basically, we basically took the code, we took some code parts of OpenSSL and uh, did a naive implementation using the RC2 code and the MD5 code of uh, OpenSSL. That was the naive implementation of everything. And there we had like, okay, for the full attack, it would take us something like 50 days or so, right? which is pretty long and we wanted to be better. Then we asked the people from Hashcat, so the Hashcat, uh, 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 the, uh, the Hashcat team, one of the, co one of the authors of Hashcat is also a co-author of Drown. And so we sent him the code and asked him, can you, can you help us? Because it is pretty similar to password cracking, what we're doing, right? Drown is pretty similar to, to, uh, uh, uh cryptography wise, uh, with password cracking. And then he took the code overnight and, and made something like a factor 30 or so improvement to it, which is really like, okay, this is crazy. <laughs> Absolutely stunning, right? And so, um, so we ported this on Amazon EC EC2 and, uh, and found out that for the cost of $440, we could break one TLS connection in eight hours, right? So this is a pretty substantial improvement. Okay, cool. So now we have a practical attack against many TLS servers. And this works, this is, this is like the, uh, this is the drown attack that works against every uh, 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 SSL version 2 implementation out there. 
Now we have two implementation errors in OpenSSL, which are interesting enough so that we have to show them because they make Drown really, really easy. The first one, we dubbed it uh, uh, Cypher Suite Selection Bug. It works like this. Before we can understand this bug, we need to understand that there is, when you, when you do SSL configuration or TLS configuration, you always have a protocol version and you have a Cypher Suite. And with every new uh, 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 protocol version, there was a bunch of Cypher suites released, right? And so what many people did is they uh, always configured their Cypher suites. So they said, okay, we only use the secure Cypher suites, uh, and, um, and then we disable the port. So here, for example, we uh, disabled SSL version 3 in order to pre prevent the poodle attack. But SSL version 2 was not explicitly disabled. Right? which meant the open SSL behind that, it would enable SSL version 2, but there was not, all the export ciphers would be forbidden. Right? So this cipher suite configuration here would forbid export 40 bits uh, 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 cipher suites. So therefore, drown shouldn't work. Okay? So how does uh, like SSL version 2 do the cipher suite negotiation? Right? Um, it works like this. So in the client, hello, the client asks, hey, uh, server, do you want to talk with export ciphers? And the SSL version 2 would respond, sorry, I don't do export ciphers, right? And then the standard compliant SSL version 2 client would say, okay, oh, too bad. Okay, bye. See you next time. Or maybe try another protocol version or so, something like this. Um, now, this is the relevant code um, that, will, that will be used afterwards, after the handshake that I've showed you right now. So let's just assume the client wouldn't say, okay, bye, sorry, it's really bad that we can't uh, uh, talk exports. Uh, so if the client says afterwards, okay, I, I wanna talk export anyway, let's have a look how the, what, what the code does. So here we receive the data from the network. This is like this, um, uh, this is that message that uh, contains the encrypted pre-master secret and that also contains the cipher suite that the client just selected. Um, it will get uh, the SSL cipher suite by that char that came in. So each cipher suite has one byte, uh, uh, or, or put it differently, so uh, there's a byte that denotes a certain cipher suite, and this function will just get a pointer to this particular crypto code. If this was not uh, successful, and not successful means the uh, uh, a cipher suite was selected that is not compiled in, okay? And uh, if it is compiled in, it will simply be used. So who sees the part that checks the configuration? So we haven't, we haven't certainly found it, right? So it's not there, okay? So basically what happens is a non-standard compliant SSL version 2 can force that handshake. So we say, wanna talk export ciphers? Nah, I don't do export ciphers, sorry. Okay, and we go, right, okay, let's, let's talk export 40 anyway. And he would say, okay, sure, we can do that. <laughs> sure. So the, the story behind here is uh, like this. Nimrod did this, uh, uh, used Scappy, a very bad Scappy implementation of, uh, of our, of uh, like some kind of a scanner in order to, to, to look how many uh, systems on the internet supported SSL version 2. And I did the first scan. And I found like this huge amount of numbers of SSL version 2 scanners. And then I used a different scanner that just looked for SSL version 2. And it would say, no, SSL version 2 is not supported. And I debugged, and I debugged, and I debugged. This took us weeks. And then I saw that Nimrod was just too, uh, uh, he was simply too lazy to parse this message. So he would just say, hey, want to talk export ciphers? Yeah, 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 let's just talk export. But he, d he didn't just care what the, what the server was, was responding. And so this took us, yeah, so we were lucky, okay? Um, if we didn't have this, uh, uh, this implementation bug, we probably wouldn't have found many of those. We wouldn't even have uh, found this bug. So independ independently of your SSL con configuration, of your Cypher Suite configuration, using this bug against OpenSSL, we can negotiate whatever we want over SSL version 2, okay? But using a non-standard compliant SSL uh, client.
Okay, so this means the server is vulnerable to drown, and this is even though you disabled SSL version 2 export ciphers, which is cool. Uh, the second one is a special drown, and this is really, it's really very special. Um, it's also an implementation flaw. It's not a, it's not a, uh, it's, it's an implementation flaw. So let's again use this cipher suite. So we use RC2 with 128 bit keys, uh, but we transfer all except the 40 bits in clear. We have talked about this before, right? An implementation flaw allowed to use these clear bits, so the bits that are sent in clear with non-export ciphers. So for non-export ciphers, we said MK clear needs to be zero. This is not the case here. So a standard conforming client would uh, uh, like, uh, right? So for a non-export cipher that we have here, we would use all the 16 bytes, so the 100, 128 bits, would be filled with the secret part that we just extracted from this, random, from, from this encrypted pre-master secret, okay? If we send four clear bytes, along with a 16-byte pre-master secret that was encrypted, it will still be pre-pended to the actual encrypted pre-master secret. So that means K13, K14, K15 would simply fall off, okay? Which beca becomes really interesting when we send 15 clear bytes. <laughs> because then all of a sudden, we, uh, we have a server verify that was encrypted with a 128-bit key where we know uh, uh, all but one byte, and that we can brute force on average 128 encryptions, right? So, and now we do this like in a in in in, in a stepping mode, right? So uh, we we send 15 zero bytes as MK clear. We break this cipher text. We learn K1. In the second step, we send 14 zero bytes. We know K1 from the previous step, so we brute force K2. Uh, in the next step, we send 13 uh, zero bytes. We know K1, we know K2. We want to brute force K3, and we do it, right? And then, uh, like for this case where uh, we send zero uh, zero bytes, we have learned K1 to K15, and only have one byte, and we need to brute force it. It's again 128 bit, right? Okay. So that means, uh, so we dubbed this special drown because it's a, a, a special a special version of this attack. The generic drown still has two to the 40 complexity per Oracle uh, request. And we need to have something like 1000 Oracle requests. So it's pretty substantial. But this two to the 40 in case of special drown uh, goes down to 15 probe connections and uh, altogether approximately less than 2000 uh, encrypt trial encryptions. So this can be done with it. The full attack can be done within a few uh, uh, minutes on, a, on a, just a normal Linux laptop, right? which is very, very critical. So what is interesting here is uh, this bug has been fixed by an uh, OpenSSL developer without knowing that it was fixed. So Nimrod and I, we submitted a bug that was totally unrelated to Drown. We didn't even know Drown. Uh, this is like one and a half years ago or so. And OpenSSL uh, did a patch, and they patched this bug without knowing what it, what it actually was. So it wasn't really a silent fix because no one was really noticing what, what was going on here. But later, later we figured out that, it's, that this is pretty substantial. Why I'm explaining this to you is uh, we, can scan, uh, we can scan again the internet for this. Uh, and we can look at who didn't patch their OpenSSL when we submitted the patch like one and a half years before, right? And so uh, this here means, this is like the uh, this is the amount of internet hosts that run some kind of uh, uh, some kind of encryption and that use SS open SSL that is more than one year old. Right? So these people don't don't really patch. And when you when you uh, uh, when you compare this to the to to the amount of servers that are vulnerable to drown, you will see that most of them are open SSL actually, right? Because the numbers are very similar. Okay. So in summary, there's just one sentence that I can say here. Ancient SSL version 2 breaks current TLS. And we can do nothing else than, than just disabling SSL version 2, right? It's dead for good. 
But who, the, the, an important discussion is also what's, who's, to, who's to blame for, uh, for drown? So what was the fault here? So for, uh, the first one is, is pretty obvious. So we have some crypto design flaws were done in the 90s. Okay, that's nothing that is really too surprising. Okay, right? It's 20 years ago, many things happened between them. Um, we have some crypto implementation flaws from the 90s, and like the open SSL guys were like, okay, I've never looked at SSL, SSL version 2 code. It's been there forever, nobody has looked at it, and so it's really old implementation code. Um, what is more a problem is the crypto configuration flaws. So people were, uh, were, were configuring uh, their, uh, their SSL servers in a, in a pretty bad way. And what is also quite interesting is the export, export ciphers, export 40 bits, is a thing, is an, is an essential part to drown. So drown wouldn't be a practical attack if we hadn't the Clinton administration who forced this crypto regulation that only uh, export, export cryptography may only have like 40 bits in, in secret. Okay, so what are the mitigations for, for the administrators here? So disable uh, SSL version 2 and SSL version 3 while you're at it, right? Because it's also, so SSL is insecure, right? Don't use the word SSL anymore. TLS is the real thing, okay? And then obviously update, update your open SSL regularly, which is a thing that you should do for every library that is in some kind of security relevant, okay? So this is the mitigation for the admin. The mitigation for the citizen, in my opinion, is vote against crypto backdoors. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? Okay, we have one question, I think. We start with microphone three, please. Uh, yeah, actually it's two questions. Uh, one is how specific this is for RSA? I mean, that, would it work also for Diffie-Hellman-based crypto? And also, after the hat bleed, uh, a lot of people start looking into the uh, OpenSSL code and even forks started and so on. So has the situation improved since then? Uh, so the first question was, is it, um, is it uh, limited to RSA? Yes, it is somehow. Uh, we, can, we can impersonate the server uh, with, uh, like, when we have substantial hardware, we can impersonate the server uh, simply, well, it, uh, it's, it's hard to explain like this without, uh, 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 like without uh, slides for this. So, so, so look at the paper. The, so we have broken quick uh, using this. We can break Diffie Hellman, but this needs to, this is not an offline attack. It needs to be an active man in the middle. Okay. This was your first question and it's uh, limited to RSA. Yeah. So, uh, so for example, um, yeah, so Diffie Hellman doesn't work. And your second question was, excuse me? Uh, if the situation with uh, open SSL or other SSL yeah. implementations has improved since Heartbleed. Okay, so this uh, bug hasn't popped up in one of the audits, probably because people didn't care about SSL version two because it's already messed up, right? So people were doing a focused audit, which is what I would expect. They did a good job there. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have questions from the internet? No. Okay, uh, microphone one, please. Uh, more of a note, um, when you say you have to update your OpenSSL regularly, something that's important is that you actually restart all your services because if you just update your OpenSSL implementation, all the running processes are still linked against the old version that's a deleted file and you're still vulnerable unless you actually restart every single one of your services that links against OpenSSL. But there goes your uptime, right? 1,000 days uptime, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Microphone four, please. Um, you mentioned that um, there's a factor of 1,000 that you have to apply to the 20 to the four, uh, two to the 40. Um, where does that come from? I think I missed that. It, it comes from Bleichenbacher's algorithm, right? So it's uh, when Bleichenbacher's algorithm from 1998 was published, it was dubbed the million questions attack because you used to have to send like one mil on average one million messages between uh, client and server uh, in order to, to decrypt uh, the ciphertext. Um, 
uh, this has changed dramatically in, in, in the years between. So there are several papers that did improvements to the, to the attack, and now it's boiling down to, to 1,000 approximately. It depends on the size, it depends on the pre-master secret, but on average, 1,000 connections is what we need. Okay. Thank you. And the next question is on microphone one, please. Uh, this is just a paranoid question about if you're using the OpenSSL library, when you said um, disable the protocols, I presume that means when you do the function call where you pass in no TLS version or no SSL version, there's no SSL. Yeah. Has someone checked that they're actually checking that? If they're not checking the protocols, uh, if they're not checking the cipher suites rather, um, are we guaranteed that doing that means you're protected? Can I, if, if I've... If I've said no SSL v2 when I pass in, when I uh, set up the uh, context in the library, does that mean I can breathe easy? Breathe easy? Uh, so OpenSSL deleted the SSL version 2 code after we did the, uh, okay, after we told I, them about it. So it's fine. All, Just update OpenSSL and you're, you'll be fine. It will be deleted. It's not there in the repository anymore. That's what I wanted to hear. Great. Okay. Thanks. And restart your server. <laughs> your, sorry, the service. Microphone five, five in the back, please. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, um, have you looked into uh, other uh, crypto libraries except OpenSSL? Yeah, so um, most of the modern crypto libraries, um, so with modern I mean the ones that appeared in the last few years, they didn't implement SSL version 2 at all anymore. So Libre okay. SSL, for example, they just deleted the code. Uh, Boring SSL deleted the code, uh, like the Python libraries, and so they didn't even implement it, and, and so on and so on. But all the ones that, were, that we looked at, for example, the, the code that is in IIS, S-channel, it, uh, it still supports SSL version 2, and it has the same, the same protocol flaws. So it, uh, if you support SSL version 2, you're vulnerable independently of, of, of the implementation, at least how we looked at it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I think microphone one, please. Why the name Drown? Uh, the <laughs> oh, that's a good question. So there's, uh, I think, uh, so, so Nimrod came up with the initial idea and he has this, like his favorite movie where this plays a role and then we did a backronym, which, we, which, which I don't remember anymore. Right? It's, it's written in the paper, sorry about it. I, I, I don't even know the, the backronym any, anymore. It's just a working name and then it got like viral and yeah. And of course, the inf more information is provided on the far plan. So, any other questions? Okay, uh, in this case, I have a question. Um, usually, um, you say, okay, the, uh, which, which um, politician was it that said, okay, please uh, weaken the strength? The, 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 the security, the SL, uh, V2 security. I'm sorry, I don't, um, I don't get the audio here. Oh, yeah, of course, the audio on the stage is not that good. Yeah. Um, let's say more in, in, in general information. Um, we have the politicians that try to uh, weaken the security. Mm -hmm. um, so which one was it again? Uh, this was the Clinton administration. The Clinton, okay. But this is not to, I mean, every, every politician obviously wants to, wants to do this because of terrorism. And yes, of course, like that, you know? because and you're all is, that bad people. Yeah, and so we, if we do this right now, if you have crypto regulations right now, we at least make sure that maybe in 10 years, maybe five years, maybe, maybe 15 years, we have another bunch of crypto PhD students who can write their PhD thesis on it, how to break them, right? <laughs> so that's maybe one good thing about it, but it's, and generally it's not a good idea. Okay, uh, any other questions in the meantime? I think microphone five, is this, is this a question? No, he sits just down. Um, oh, there's a question. No? Hi. Yes, four, please. Um, you said that for, well, for mail servers, it's a, still a good idea to sup, support old crypto. So with the drown attack, it isn't anymore, I expect, or did I misunderstand it? So there's an argument of supporting SSL version 3, even though it's broken. But it's broken in a sense, so the Poodle attack is still... Um, it's, it's obviously more effort breaking SSL version 3 than uh, reading the plain text, okay? With the drown attack, it's different because uh, even when you use secure TLS connections, you can still break it by exploiting SSL version 2. 
So, and, and the, the, the word for this is opportunistic encryption. So some bad encryption is even better than no encryption. And this changed for drone. And I think this is the first attack where, where this works cross protocol. But don't you compromise, oh, you, you don't compromise your RSA private key with no. drone. Okay. No. Yeah, then I get it. So yeah. you don't need to buy new keys for it, right? You can still use your same key. Just, uh, just, uh, remove SSL version two from your configuration and uh, restart the server and you're fine. Or update OpenSSL. Okay. Any other questions? In this case, Please give an anniversary edition applause to Sebastian Schinzel. Thank you very much.